The rise of the vocal cord parasites goes back approximately 300 million years to the Permian period. At that time, they were not even parasites, but predatory autotrophs. They are believed to have been the common ancestor to the Pentastomida and the Cyclops genus of copepods. However, Earth's environment underwent a violent change at the end of the Permian period. The cause is unclear, but evidence suggests that over 90% of the Earth's organisms at that time died out. The most pronounced threat to the protoparasites was the severe reduction in oxygen concentration. The result was cladogenesis, a splitting that gave birth to a new strain that could parasitize other organisms' respiratory apparatus. This survival tactic helped lower their oxygen consumption, and inhabiting the throat kept them securely in contact with inhaled air. The best survivors were those that parasitized the reptiles that flourished at the time. Entering the Triassic period, the reptiles evolved into dinosaurs, and the protoparasites shared in their success. Dinosaurs developed respiratory organs called air sacs to adapt to the low oxygen environment. These in particular helped the protoparasites thrive. But another trial awaited them. The end of the Triassic period saw another drastic change in the Earth's environment. For most parasites, the male and female take the same host. Many are, in fact, hermaphrodites. Originally, the vocal cord parasites were as well. But for any strain to ride out a severe environmental change, it must secure a steady pool of genetic diversity. Class Another split. Now the newest strain procreated with mates found in other hosts. And in order to increase its encounters with those mates, the new strain utilized the voice of its host. They came to inhabit the host's vocal cords. This truly was the birth of the vocal cord parasite. The parasites developed the host's pharynx to form resonating chambers and use them to produce sophisticated mating calls. The relatively upright posture of the dinosaurs was important in this because the crooked L-shaped pharynx was more suited to the development of resonating chambers. These developments ushered in a time of great prosperity for the parasites. But for the third time, the parasites had a major hurdle to overcome. The meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period which spelled the end of the dinosaurs. With their hosts extinct, the vocal cord parasites had no option but to find a new habitat. Birds. As genetic successors to the dinosaurs, with functioning air sac apparatus already in place, birds were the perfect choice. But the parasites could not survive in birds that flew at high altitudes with thinner air. So they parasitized ground-dwelling birds and altered their respiratory system for the sake of reproduction. They gave the birds the means to produce sophisticated sounds. The syrinx responsible for chirping. This is the proof that points to activation of Fox P2 in songbirds as well as humans. The Cenozoic era began with a rise in oxygen concentration, which helped mammals to evolve and increase in size. The parasites then shifted to humans as a more effective host. Humans' bipedal upright walking meant that our throats could support larger resonating chambers. At first, vocal cord parasites entered humans using birds as their intermediate host. But eventually, they changed to conducting their entire life cycle within human hosts. What happened next is as I have already described. People took the vocalizing prowess given them by the parasites and made it language. 
and once the parasites could no longer use it as their mating call, they died out. Or in other words, the parasites overcame all evolutionary hurdles except humanity. Skullface shared his opinion on this matter. He said the Ethnic Cleansers project was sure to succeed. After all, the parasites had a grudge against us humans. To think we awoke them after such a long slumber, just so they could sate their thirst for vengeance. It is terrible. Unforgivable. And yet, it is what I have done. I learned of the vocal cord parasite's existence in literature belonging to the Foundation. It was little more than a theory. The question was, why does only Homo sapiens among all primates have highly developed language? Human versus everything else. The missing link between these was the mystery that gave rise to this theory. I was fascinated by the idea of their existence. In the Dine creation myth, the Neyo Dine, who first inhabited the world, were insect-like creatures. I came to imagine that those insect-like creatures could be humans living in symbiosis with the vocal cord parasites. But I had not the faintest idea of how I could resurrect them. That is when Skullface came to me. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back, but there was an alternate vessel they could use. A relative species of the Pentastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts. But its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, a path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. Cypher used this to effect a reverse evolution of the modern parasite and resurrect the vocal cord parasites. They interpose a developmental mechanism to the ontogenetic stage analogous to when the relative species first appeared, the point at which it split from the vocal cord parasites, forcing its evolution down the other path, the vocal cord parasite path. The larvae is produced by the vocal cord parasites Reborn. I do not know in detail how Cypher accomplished this, but clearly they have access to high level genetic technologies. Skullface said it was the work of a genius woman scientist, and that the relative species in question was first discovered by a group once called the Philosophers. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. He charged me with two demands. First, to add lethality to these organisms that had once lived in peace with man. By unleashing the larvae's latent desire to consume nutrients from the host's lung tissue, making them eat and eat until the lungs were destroyed. Second, to have both male and female inhabit the same host and copulate then and there only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. What he would do to the Dene if I failed? I had no choice. <laughs>